Thank you, Alfred. And for our next session, please welcome Chandran to talk to us about the resilience of a city. Chandran? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good day, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're all keeping well and safe. Uh, my name is Chandra Naya. I am the founder and CEO of the Global Institute for Tomorrow. As a keynote speaker, I'd like to essentially take the license, uh, and that's the whole point of a keynote, to slightly provide a provocation for the day's proceedings so that uh, we don't get stuck in our usual conversations. And I'd like you to indulge me as I try and, and, and serve that purpose as a keynote speaker. So let me start by saying that uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, but at the same time, I would like to challenge some of the basic assumptions that we tend to make at conferences like this. Uh, elites like us gather, we follow the latest fad, the fashion, and then we pontificate about the world, uh, ourselves typically disconnected from the realities of what the world, what the world is, is about. And let us be very clear, we live in the era of the pandemic, the first time in 100 years that the world has essentially been turned upside down. Have you learned anything? Uh, I am not sure that we have. So uh, my role as a keynote speaker today is to try and get you all to perhaps get a bit more intellectually honest about the challenges we face. Don't go down the rabbit holes that we all tend to do and flock to. Um, and to really think a bit more expansively about the role of technology, connected cities, whatever the terminology is. Today, we have all bec it's become very fashionable to talk about connections, uh, talk about digital, and somehow it's all going to make us smarter. Well, it's not as simple as that. So let me like, try and put together three streams of thought related to the, the, the conference. The first thing I've been asked to speak about is, of course, the overarching theme, which is connected cities. Then I'm going to tie in this idea of resilience, what that actually means. And then finally, uh, make a, a short note about what I called uh, build and stay, very relevant to developing economies, but also particular to, to, to a city like Hong Kong, which is my home. So let's talk about connected. What do we actually mean by connections? Um, what is the disconnect that we seek to essentially uh, narrow? Well, what are those things? And they depend on where you live in the world. So I like to start by saying, what are we trying to connect? So let's look at the major cities of the world. The major cities of the world are not necessarily all the same. They suffer from all different sorts of uh, ailments. But my point is, we have to fundamentally have a basic understanding of where we are in this, uh, at, at the current point of time in the world. So connected city is one that, in my view, understands a basic truth. And I urge everyone today to remind themselves of a simple basic truth. The human beings are essentially biological beings, and we live on a biophysical planet. We don't live on a digital platform. That's the first thing I like everyone to remember. That doesn't mean I am anti-digital or anti-technology. Secondly, that biological platform must cater to the biological needs of human beings. Human beings are not drones, they are not robots, and they will not be replaced by AI. That's important. All that stuff about technology, very good. I'm an engineer by training, so I've got nothing against technology. But human beings are biological beings, and we have just been reminded by the pandemic that we live in a biosphere, and that biosphere is under threat. So the connections that we want to make cannot be simply devoid of an understanding of the biological realities. So I've coined a phrase uh, rather controversially saying the future is not digital, it is biological. So what do we need to connect if we understand that basic truth? Depends where you live. So let's take, for example, uh, one of the things we've all been obsessed with for the last 18 months or so, sanitation, cleanliness, hygiene. What have we all been told to do? Wash your hands, be clean. It all requires water. So just again, a reminder to most people that the majority of the world don't have access to clean and safe water. Uh, and then more importantly, if you use water, then there's wastewater. Much of our environment is contaminated by essentially the 8 billion people on the planet, peaking at perhaps 10 billion, and that's going to be a huge amount of work. 
But we often talk, we, we, we never talk about connect connections and connectivity from the point of view of that sort of most basic, fundamental, health-defining connectivity. So I've argued for 10, we, 10 years that the connections, connectivity that needs, that's needed in most parts of the developing world is not fiber optics, uh, but essentially water supply systems, sanitation, healthcare systems, and all of those things. So that's one of the, one of the things I'd like everyone to think about. Th those things are not going to be simply changed by another app or another startup. So we got to think about that. Well-being is not going to be changed by just having another app on which you can click and do some yoga at home. We got to really think about this. I know you're having sessions around the future of work. Well, the future of work, in my view, is not simply a narrow discussion about uh, work from home for white collar people. The majority of the world can't work from home. So this too is a disconnected conversation. So conversations too have become so disconnected. So what are examples of some of the disconnected conversations we have? And I'm looking through the agenda today without you know, suggesting I'm trying to be hypercritical. I notice a lot of slogans that have essentially lots of disconnects in them. Uh, that somehow technology is all something to do with digital coming from an engineering and science background, are like especially the young people who are listening to this, who want to change the world to understand that digital is not simply the be end on end all of technology. I would say perhaps over the next 50 years, the most important technology going forward is going to be uh, toilets, water supply, sanitation systems, and how do we build low cost housing. So that's a very important part of what I want to talk. Then we have a disconnect where people don't seem to understand the tyranny of the gig economy, which is essentially exploiting workers to cheap, cheap, uh, cheap labor and essentially getting people to buy things they don't need with money they don't have. Uh, that should not be the basis for using technology. And for, lastly, we don't, haven't even had a discussion about how does technology essentially start pricing in an economy which is hell-bent on compelling us to consume beyond our needs and beyond our means. Those are very important conversations to have, and we need to connect those conversations. So we can't simply talk about upskilling either, as if everyone is going to be a computer programmer or come up with a digital application. That's not the real world. Uh, that's not the real world. So when we talk about skills, we need to even talk about skills that are unrelated to digital technology, but related to a whole host of other technologies for the world we live in. So that's the thing I wanted, I wanted to, uh, us to really understand when we talk about connections. We can't connect a discussion about climate change while it's not understanding the fundamental disconnect between the way our economies run. Our economies, our uh, business models, are essentially premised on a free ride on resources, and the climate change issue is essentially based on a free ride without paying for the externalities of the use of fossil fuels. So that's, that's the one point I'd like to make. So let me move on to the issue of resilience. What do we mean by resilience again? Resilience should not be a simple discussion about you know, how technology will make uh, the economy more resilient to volatility changes and this and that. It's, it's very different in different parts of the world. Uh, two years ago, I was invited to moderate a session for the World Economic Forum and another one for the UN, which was a ministerial conference on resilience. The most interesting thing for someone like me, who has the risk of living in a place like Hong Kong, which is very advanced, and being disconnected from the rest of the world, and I like to think I'm not because I've lived in Africa, etc., was to listen to people from Mali, uh, Sudan, China, etc., talk India, talk about what resilience means in their context. So in India, going forward, given what has happened, the tragic situation in India, what will India's understanding of resilience mean going forward? I doubt it's more about fiber optics. It will be a whole different understanding of the infrastructure that needs to be built in India to essentially prevent a complete collapse of the healthcare system in the face of um, an existential threat. So that's what policy looks like, resilience looks like. The, one of the ministerial uh, attendees from Mali talked about essentially security threats, drought, they talked about water, they talked about sanitation, they talked about education. So it's very different in different societies, but these solutions are not going to come simply, and technology can play a part, particularly 
uh, a focus, uh, as is this in this conference, about digital. But it is a much more profound discussion when we talk. So let me get, come closer to home. When I talk about resilience, say in the context of Hong Kong, well, resilience in Hong Kong is not you know, taking pride in the fact that uh, families of four or five live in 300 square foot homes. Resilience is not then saying we're all connected. No, it's not. Resilience in Hong Kong might be social policies that essentially change the conditions in which the vast majority of people live, which are not uh, becoming of a city as wealthy as this, and is technologically geared. But technology, digital technology, is not going to solve that problem. It can play a part in making people more, uh, uh, providing greater convenience, etc. but it's not going to solve that basic, uh, basic problem. So for me, resilience has to be toned, uh, has to be fine-tuned to the needs of the society and the social economic construct in each of them. But we can't simply use resilience as a blanket term by which we then uh, hide and sweep under the carpet the real issues facing it. And if we've learned anything from the pandemic, we should be very clear that simply talking about technology advancement without understanding the cracks and the fissures within society uh, is essentially a massive collective denial. Resilience in this society in Hong Kong will be connecting the blues and the yellows. It will be about bringing together the divided society. It will be about low-cost housing. It will not be about water supply, which we have ample about. But it might change. It might be. How do we change from a society which is dependent on 95% of our food is imported? That is not a resilient future. That is not a sustainable future. How do we change that? We can't change that. Singapore, for instance, has announced that it's going to reduce its food dependency and create a society where their food dependency will be reduced by 30%. That would be a massive change. And then you bring in the technology. So that's uh, my point about resilience. And uh, we can talk about carbon resilience, etc., but not hocus-pocus discussions about carbon neutrality without understanding the fundamental lifestyle changes that will be imposed. Technology will enable it, but it will not change anything unless we have the lifestyle changes imposed by policy shifts. And my final point that I was asked to make is one about stay and build. Around the developing world particularly, this is a focus on the developing world, many people look for a better, greener pastures in, in the Western world or more advanced economies, etc. And I would argue that if we are to essentially leverage the technologies of the day, bring the future, uh, bring, make a better future, then the best and brightest in the world must stay where they are and build. Societies are not built by people leaving. The strongest societies in the world were built by people who put blood, sweat, and tears into building their societies. Just running away and suggesting that there's a better opportunity may be one option, but it's not essentially the way we build societies. So I know in Hong Kong, uh, given the protests we had, the geopolitical tensions within which Hong Kong got caught as a pawn, etc., uh, there are grave concerns that young people will essentially leave. I argue every time I meet young Hong Kong people, stay and build. You want a different future? You have got to be part of it. But part of it is partly, of course, we all say what we think, we protest, etc. But my God, there is no, there is no uh, better thing to do than fight the good cause, not for others, but for the people of this city, and even if you're in Bangkok, whether you're in Singapore, and stay and build. And the best and the brightest of this city must stay here and build. But at the same time, we need connections. We need government policies to be connected. We need connections around what is the social discord that we're having. Why are young people disillusioned? Why don't they want to stay? The politics is one thing, but fundamentally people stay because they see a brighter future. And that brighter future in Hong Kong, in terms of a connected city, needs to be one in the aspirations are connected. And young people need to see that. We need a vision that is connected to the aspirations as well. Well, as you all can see, I can go on about this, but uh, if you're interested, I've written a piece about Stay and Build. And it doesn't just refer to Hong Kong. Uh, it came about when I did a talk in Europe to a load, whole host of young people, and there are a lot of Africans and Asians there. And they said, oh, you know, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to be discriminated in Europe, etc." I said, go home, stay and build in your countries. It's too easy to just leave. So let me leave it at that. Uh, enjoy, I hope you all have a great conference. And um, some of what I say 
uh, will provoke some thinking. And let me also say that I'm not anti-technology. I am for the technology. But technology is simply an enabler. We need a sense of purpose, what we want to do. And once we understand what we want to do, we understand the human beings, our biological beings, then we can apply the best technolo technology and innovations in startups. Thank you very much.